the final witness for today's hearing is Gerald Wales. <laughs> Now you are Gerald of Tabari, otherwise known as Gerald of Gerald Wales, in that case. I am. And could you please tell us your profession? An enthusiastic writer, commentator. You could say that I was the Nicky Furlong of my age. I, I worked for a time in royal service. And when did you commence that service, Gerald? Well, I, well, I began working in the royal service. I, I think as royal clerk in 1184, and my service ended in 1196. And you mentioned that you were a writer. Could you please tell the inquiry a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I, I have a full list of my publications here. Now, I composed my Topographia Hibernica in 1186. I completed my Exponatio Hibernica in 1189. The first is a history and topography of Ireland. Uh, the latter is an account of the conquest of that country. In 1191, I finished my Itinerarium Cambriae, and I also penned a description of Wales, the Descriptio Cambriae. I also wrote a life of St. Hugh of Lincoln, amongst other works. So as you can see, I'm quite an accomplished writer, a man of great learning. If you do say so yourself. Mm. You might answer any questions my friends have. Very impressive um, CV, uh, Gerald. I just have a short number of questions. You might address your answers to the court. Um, my understanding, Gerald, is that you made a number of trips uh, to Ireland, did you not? When did you visit Ireland? No, oh, well, I, I first set foot in Ireland in and around 1183. I came then with my brother, Philip de Barry. Uh, my second visit came uh, while I was in royal service. I accompanied the young Prince John on his trip here in uh, 1185 before returning to England in 1186. Very good. And can you remind us once again when you composed your uh, typographia? Oh, certainly. I composed that text upon my return from Ireland in the spring of 1186. Very good. That's very straightforward. Jared, is it fair to say you were closely connected to many of those men who first fought in Ireland in the years between 1169 and Henry II's arrival there in 1171? No. Oh, yes, indeed. So when Robert Fitzmaurice and Fitzstevens was a maternal uncle, and Myler Fitzhenry was a cousin of mine, and Maurice Fitzgerald was another maternal uncle of mine. Lots of family. Very good, yes indeed. Uh, so to summarise, you had close connections in Ireland, I think that's fair to say, and you were present in Ireland yourself on more than one occasion, I think that's also correct hmm. to say. So I suppose the, the uh, rub of, of this particular issue is, can you please tell us a little bit more about Ireland, about the state of religion in Ireland, um, and also about the Irish moors and practices, perhaps, in, uh, in opposition to the Norman practices. No, no, I'd, I'd be more than happy to do so. In short, the Irish are a barbarous people, wallowing in vice and unconstructed in the rudiments of the Catholic faith. They do not yet pay tithes or first fruits or contract marriages. They do not avoid incest. They do not attend God's church with due reverence. Men, in many places of this country, they debauch the wives of their dead brothers, having evil and incestuous relations with them. In some corners of Ireland, there are even many who are not baptised. Not baptised? They truly are barbarians. Do you encounter such people on your travels there? I heard from some sailors that were driven by a storm into the northern vastnesses of the Sea of Connacht, that they encountered a small boat containing two men, all but naked, Judge, who had never even seen a ship made of wood before. They didn't recognize bread nor cheese, and they said that they feasted solely on meat, fish, and milk. When asked if they were Christians and baptized, they replied that they had heard yet nothing of Christ. That is truly shocking, hmm. and I'm very conscious of the fact there might be people uh, in, the, uh, in the courtroom, Judge, who might find this uh, somewhat uh, unedifying. Hmm. It might be an, an opportunity for them to take uh, leave if needs be. What else did you see on your travels in Ireland, Jared? Well, in the land of Kennel Connell, when a king is being inaugurated, he has sexual intercourse with a white mare in front of everyone. The mare is then killed and butchered and unboiled in water. The king gets into the same water in which the horse has been boiled, 
And then all begin to eat the flesh and drink the broth. Very good. Well, I have to say that is horrific. And I look forward to Mr. Harmon's cross-examination here to explain why that happens. <laughs> it is absolutely horrific. Gerald, clearly this was a country in dire need of civilizing. I don't think anyone could disagree with that. The faith needed a helping hand in Ireland. Is that fair? No, absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, Pope Adrian recognized this and authorized our good King Henry to enter the island to put things right. But of course, you know that the right of the English king over Ireland is, is multifaceted. It is, in fact, fivefold. Oh, very good. I, I don't quite understand what you mean by fivefold. Could you elaborate on that for us a bit more, Gerald? Oh, oh gladly. I, I've written quite a lot about it, and I've carefully recorded it here. Firstly, when Gurgintius, the son of Bilinus, since king of Britain, was returning from Dacia, he found the Basque fleet into Orkney and gave them guides who sent them for the first time into Ireland. <coughs> Secondly, the kings of Ireland were among the rulers who paid tribute to King Arthur of Britain. Thirdly, the city of Bayonne, which was included in our province of Gascony, well, that's the chief city of the Basques, and they are, of course, from whom the Irish originally descended. Yes, of course. Uh, fourthly, the princes of Ireland actually bound themselves in submission to Henry II, the King of England, by pledge and oath. And fifthly and finally, the Pope granted, granted Lord Abilator to Henry, and he had the authority to do so under the donation of Constantine. Very good. That seems unquestionably clear in this particular circumstance. I suppose moving away from uh, that very fine uh, illustration uh, a little, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about Dermot McMurrah and what sort of man he was. Well, if I'm to be completely honest, Dermot was a man who preferred to be feared rather than to be loved. From the moment he took the kingship, he oppressed the nobles and raged against the chief men of his kingdom with a tyranny that was grievous and impossible to bear. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, his subjects came to turn on him when he was attacked by Rory O'Connor and Tiernan O'Rourke, and his men of rank <coughs> deserted him. And as we all know, he had to flee overseas. And could you tell us in that instance then, uh, you can tell the court what actions Dermot took thereafter? No, he made for England. And from thence he travelled to Aquitaine, and there he met Henry II. Henry received Dermot, and received from him the uh, bond of submission and the oath of fealty. Dermot then returned to Britain, weighed down with gifts, and carrying the letters patent granted him by King Henry. Thank you, Gerard. Well done again on your books. We have no further questions. <laughs> They're available for signing afterwards. <laughs> Mr. O'Higgins has finished making his speeches. Uh, it's fair to say, Gerald, that you're an educated man, an intellectual, a man of letters, well-versed in the classics. No, I, I wouldn't disagree with that assessment. No, I, I know my Virgil, Lucan, Josephus, Caesar. Yes, um, well-versed. So wouldn't that explain the various classical tropes that litter your works on Ireland? Uh, I'm sorry. Well, you, you have a lot to say about the fickleness of women, about Dervla. Hmm. You attach a great importance to the sealing of the conquest by virtue of a marriage to a daughter. Were these not simply borrowed from Virgil's Aeneid? You tell us that Dermot danced before the severed heads of his enemies, and not simmery, simmery, simply mirroring Lucan's account of Ptolemy's treatment of the head of Pompey. I could go on and on, but you're simply littering your text with classical illusions. And I put it to you that the question must be asked, did any of these things that you allege actually happen? Uh, well, um, uh, well, I don't think it's wrong to condemn a writer, particularly one as gifted as I am, uh, for the occasional embellishment. The classical illusions are there to, to emphasize a point. But isn't it the case that we've gone far beyond poetic license or literary license, the occasional literary flourish, you not only borrow from classical writers, you lift from them wholesale throughout your texts. Yes. I might put to you the following passage from your uh, uh, topographia, if I may. 
While men usually progresses from the woods to the fields, and from the fields to settlements and communities of citizens, this people despises work on the land and has little use for the money-making of towns. They use the fields generally as pasture, but pasture in poor condition. Little is cultivated and even less sown. The fields cultivated are so few because of the neglect of those who should cultivate them. But many of them are naturally very fertile and productive. The wealth of the soil is lost, not through the fault of the soil, but because there are no farmers to cultivate even the best land. The soil is not to be blamed, but rather the want of industry on the part of the cultivator. He is too lazy to plant the foreign types of trees that would grow very well down here. I am prepared to stand over every word of that. I have to put it to you that you're borrowing from a lexicon of established ethnographic tropes. An ancient Akkadian text described the barbarians as the people who knew not the grain. Otto of Freising praised the beauty of Hungary, but he commented that it was not greatly adorned with buildings or houses because of the ways of its barbarous people. And I put it to you, you're simply doling out well-worn stereotypes. Now, I stand over everything that I wrote. Oh, it's scripsy, scripsy. You do it elsewhere. I'd like to read you another passage from your topographia. In that text, you allege that the Irish are untrustworthy. You write, moreover, above all other peoples, they always practice treachery. When they give their word to anyone, they do not keep it. And you continue, from an old and evil custom, they always carry an ax. In this way, if they have a feeling for any evil, they can more quickly give it effect. Woe to brothers amongst the barbarous people. Woe to, ki to kinsmen. When they are alive, they are relentlessly driven to death. When they are gone, vengeance is demanded for them. The Irish are treacherous. I cannot enumerate the number of times that they submit to us, ally to us, before they then turn their backs on us. Let's take a look at your sources for your various works because you've made much of your sources. And the fact that you were present in Ireland on two occasions, isn't that right? Yes, I was. Can you tell me, Gerald, did you ever travel up north? No, I did not. I principally traveled in Leinster. And can you tell me then, where is Senel Connell, the land in which this debauched horse inauguration ceremony that you speak of allegedly took place? Uh, well, it's uh, not that far that, or, or that distant it's away from the there. It's north, isn't it? Uh, well, uh, um, were you ever in Western Connacht? Um, well, I I couldn't. Uh, I think you need to answer the question. I was not in Western Connacht. Thank you. No. And where did your wonderful story about the semi-naked men who had never heard of Christ play out? It took place in Connacht. Uh, but in my defence, I never claimed to have seen it with my own eyes. I told the court. I was told this by some sailors. But surely this is the point, Gerald. The two most sensational stories that you've told us, the stories upon which Mr O'Higgins has placed such reliance uh, in his questioning of you, you witnessed neither of them. No, I so I have to put it to you, how much weight should this inquiry place on those stories? Well, I think I've been quite open and honest with you. I've told you my sources. I trust my sources. You wrote in the Topographia that the Irish live like beasts, that they are a barbarous people, literally barbarous, that they are the least instructed in the rudiments of faith, that they do not pay tithes, they do not contract proper marriages. I'd like to read to you a passage from Bernard of Clairvaux's Life of St. Malachy. Oh. The passage runs as follows. Once he had begun to exercise his office, the man of God realized that he had been sent not to men, but to beasts. Never had he known such men so steeped in barbarism. Never had he found people so wanton in their way of life, so cruel in superstition, so heedless of faith, lawless, dead set against discipline, so foul in their lifestyle, Christian in name, yet pagans at heart. They gave no tithes, no first fruits. 
They did not contract legitimate marriage nor make confession. I have to put it to you that you simply copied this. Listen, Mr. Harmon, you're, you're entitled to your opinion. And what about your assertion that Dermot swore an oath of fealty to King Henry? Actually, before I continue, I think you said that this meeting took place in Aquitaine, isn't that right? Uh, yes. But was it not in Saumur? Oh, um, you know, I, I, I really can't recall at this stage. Well, maybe just take my word for it on this one particular issue. Uh. Do we have any evidence of oaths of fealty in Ireland before the arrival of you and your pals? Do you think Dermot was aware that he was swearing fealty? Aware of what it meant? Well, you'd, you'd have to ask Dermot that. Uh, he swore fealty. That's what I wrote. He became Henry's liege man without any notion about what that actually meant. Thank you very much. You might answer any questions that my friend might have for you. Very good. Yes, uh, just one or two more questions, <coughs> picking up on some of the themes spoken about by my friend. Um, now, in Virgil, and again in Lucan, we hear how a tyrant summoned military aid from overseas and condemned his own nation to foreign conquest. Gerald, that sounds awfully like your interpretation of events in Ireland, with Dermot playing the role of the tyrant. Were you not simply carried away by your own pen? How much of your account can we really believe? Now, I gave an accurate account of Dermot as I saw it. We have no further questions. Very good. Thank you very much, Gerald.